My name is Aaron, I'm one of the pastors here. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? I haven't been up here in a couple weeks, so if I'm talking fast, I'm sorry. I just get really excited. This is Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Let's pray. Father, today I ask that you would teach us what it means to be a people who trust in your provision that you have given to us as your people that whatever accusations come against us, that we would see who you are and what you have done, and we would trust in that. And in so doing, our entire lives would be changed as we glorify you with them. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are doing this uh, series this summer, calling it The Miners. The Miners are the last 12 books of the Old Testament. We did a little baseball logo, and granted, they didn't have baseball at the time. They probably had stick ball, because every kid wants to hit something with a stick at some point, so they probably had that. But anyway, these minor prophets come through when they prophesy for a period of about 500 years. Actually, all those prophets you read in the Old Testament prophesy in the last 500 years of the Old Testament. Testament. Now, Israel has a history that spans thousands of years with a guy named Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel. Israel has 12 sons, which essentially become those 12 tribes of Israel. They end up in slavery in Egypt at one point, where they're there for over 400 years till they cry out, and God liberates them and leads them out, and they eventually come to their own country, which they name Israel, because they're very creative like that. And so they have this country, and for a very long time, God is the king of this country, but they get dissatisfied with that. And then they say, well, we want a human king instead. And so they get a succession, a succession of three human kings in their one united kingdom. In 900 BC, the northern tribes are tired of the taxation and all the things that are being placed on them by those two southern tribes, and essentially Israel splits. In 900 BC, you have the northern ten tribes that now call themselves Israel, and the southern two tribes, which are known by the name of Judah. The northern ten tribes never have one godly king, and God keeps saying, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to do something to bring you back to me. And in 722 BC, God sends the Assyrians through those northern kingdoms. And what he does is he has them take them all out and takes them to slavery. Many of them are killed by the sword. The southern kingdom stays where it is until 587 BC when the Babylonians go through and they take out the Assyrians and then they take out Judah. As a matter of fact, in 586, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and any Israelites that got away, they found most of them and hauled them off to slavery in Babylon. Now, the prophets of God, they have foretold these events. You read of all these Old Testament prophets, they talk about what is going to happen. And they also talk about that Judah would one day come back and rebuild the temple. In 539 BC, the Persians overthrow everyone, and the ruler of Persia at the time is a guy named Cyrus. And Cyrus then allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. It is during that time when they're rebuilding their temple that the last three prophets of the Old Testament will speak, and they will prophesy. We've looked at two of the three so far. We've got a guy named Haggai, and Haggai comes in, and he encourages the people to rebuild the temple. And he says this over and over consider your ways, consider your ways, consider your ways. What are you doing? How are you living? Consider your ways before Lord God Almighty. Last week we talked about Malachi, the last prophet to prophesy in the Old Testament. And at his point, the temple was rebuilt, but the people were neglecting their sacrifices and lowering their commitment to God. In the middle of those two comes this guy, and his name is Zechariah. And Zechariah will focus on God choosing and desiring Israel. So we're going to look at this guy, but we're going to look at it kind of interestingly, because for the first time ever, twice in a year, I'm going to give you a message that includes the devil. You're like, what? I know. We talked about this in Job. We're going to talk about it here. Uh, the Jews return to Jerusalem from captivity. There's a lot of hope, but they get very discouraged. In 537, they come in 
and they make an altar to the Lord. In 536, they start clearing the rubble from the Temple Mount. They lay new foundations for the temple, and then everything just stops because it got really hard. And I told you that this is the difference between dreams versus reality, that they, all these people have heard the stories of the temple and Israel and Jerusalem, and it's so great, and they get there, and it is just decimated. And it's, this work is hard to do. And I told you it's kind of like a marriage. A lot of people, you know, they, they are young, and they want to get married, and they're like, we're going to get married. Oh, it's going to be great. We're never going to argue. I don't know what's wrong with all those other people who are married that argue, but we'll never argue. It's going to be a Garden of Eden right in our home. It's going to be so great. And then they get married and they're like, I married a crazy person. And then they realize that you're the crazy person too that they married. It's like, what are you? Because there's a dream versus the reality. And the reality is much harder. And so they stop working on the temple for 16 years. That's why Haggai comes along and says, hey, consider your ways, rebuild the temple. Now, during that time when they kind of cease to rebuild the temple, Cyrus in Persia is murdered. And a guy named Darius becomes his successor. And from 521 to 515 BC, he's just trying to keep his empire together as province after province starts kind of rebelling a little bit. There's eruptions all over the place. And this kind of leads into some of the things that the prophets speak about, all the shaking of the nations. And Zechariah and Haggai both will speak about how it is God who shakes the nations, that God is doing something in the world. If you have a Bible, open to Zechariah chapter 1. It's on page 513 if you have an element Bible. If not, you can use the U version or you can flip through it until you find it. And I'm going to give you some background here of what Zechariah is, you're kind of going on around him, what, what he's speaking about. And then I want to really hone in on one thing which really speaks about the gospel and who we are. And I really hope today that you don't think I'm trying to pigeonhole this into the scriptures because that's what I'm not trying to do. I don't ever want anyone to think I'm trying to make the scriptures say what I want them to say. What I do though is I really think there's a great example of what the gospel is in Zechariah. And I'm trying not to deflect, but just give me some grace and go with me. Give us some background, then we'll go in. Uh, Zechariah's book is almost split into two unique parts. Uh, first part is chapters 1 through 8, and the next part is chapters 9 through 14. There is so much difference between the two that some people think that two different people wrote those two different parts of the book. Now, I don't think so. I think that there is just a bit of time that has elapsed between the first part and the second part of the book. The text will even tell you that. Now, the first section of Zechariah, it consists of seven visions. All those visions come to Zechariah in one night so that, you know, you're a little sleepy and like, oh, another one, and you keep right. So maybe that's why it's written a little bit differently. But anyway, uh, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3 says, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. That's how it starts. And then first vision, chapter 1, verses 7 to 17, is that the kingdom of God is still working in the midst of the kingdoms of the world. That's the first vision. So Jerusalem here is destroyed. It's defeated. They're still under the Persians at this point. And so there's a lot of indifference about who God is and what he's doing in the world. Sin is running rapid, but God seems absent. And God says, I am not absent. I am still working. And this is important for us today and in every single age. Because next to sin, the most profound source of tension in a Christian life is when it seems like God doesn't care, or God is defeated, or God is absent. And God here says to his people, you are heirs of my div divine promise. Do not ever think that I am impotent. Do not ever think that I am not in control. I am still working even when you don't see it. The second vision is chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, and it talks about how God will bring judgment to the world, but it's in His time and His way and not in our timing and our way. And there's stuff about four horns here which represent judgment. The third vision is chapter 2, and it's divine promise concerning the future of Jerusalem. So there's a guy, and he's got a measuring line. It's like a really long measuring tape, and he starts measuring around the city of Jerusalem. And it's to show that God is going to bring blessing and prosperity back to his people again, so we simply need to trust him. And there's a call to God's people who are still living in Babylon to come back and be part of what God is doing in the world. There's a call to Gentiles that God is working in the entire world. The fourth vision is chapter 3, and it shows the people of God in a war with their enemy, who is Satan. Satan is not God's enemy. He is our enemy. And Satan is rebuked, and the sins of God's people are removed by the coming Messiah. That's what we're going to talk about today, by the way. Uh, the fifth vision is in chapter 4, and is the working of God's Spirit in the world. You probably heard this verse, Zechariah 4, verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. 
And it's that God's spirit works in the world to recreate the things that he has always meant to do. He redeems, he restores, and this will be the Messiah will come and he will send you as lights into the world. The sixth vision is in chapter five, and it shows that the kingdom of God is still expanding. No matter what you think, if it looks like God's been defeated, the kingdom of God is still expanding. They're probably thinking, no, the kingdom of Persia is expanding. And God's like, no, my kingdom is still expanding. And there's all these words of judgment and separating people and God calling people to come home. The seventh vision is about the judgment of God. That's in chapter six. And it talks about the inheritance of those who belong to the Messiah, who are then Abraham's seed and heirs of God's promise. And Zechariah will speak of how even when there wasn't a temple in Jerusalem, God's people were still meant to worship in truth. Then you'll jump to chapters 9 through 14, and it's all about the Messiah, the burden ultimately placed upon the Messiah for the coming salvation that God is doing in the world. There will even be verses in there that speak about the divinity of this coming Messiah, that God will connect himself to this Messiah. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, it says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. So God is saying, I'm going to come. I'm going to be crucified. This is five centuries before Jesus even shows up. He even talks about this in chapter 13 as well. And so Zechariah expected this consummation of the kingdom of God will be in spite of all the judgment that we are now experiencing in our lives. And I think if we understood that a little bit, that could help us where we are today as well. Because I think that speaks to where we are right now when we don't understand what is happening around us. And so what I want to do is kind of bring all of this together for you today around two main things that come out of Zechariah. And the first part of it, what it means that Satan accuses us, and the second thing is what it means that Jesus came to rescue us. So we're going to talk about accusation, rescue, and then how we actually live to be God's people in the world. Got that? Very simple. All right. A long intro. I know. Okay. Open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. So in this section, in chapter 3, there's a high priest. The high priest, his name is Joshua. And Joshua is standing before the judge, who is God, and he is being accused of certain things. Now, as he's standing before God, being accused, Joshua is standing in the place of all the people. He is representing God's people in this place. So Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, in our culture today, when you hear the word Satan, it's hard to believe. Unless you're watching a scary movie, then he's like seven feet tall and cloven hooves and horns, and he's all ready. He's like, ah, I eat your babies. You know, that's what we think Satan is. That's not what Satan looks like. And I'm not here to give you a treatise on Satanology, but I want to help you understand the myriad of ways that he tries to pull us away from who God calls us to be. When we think of the devil today or people talk about the devil, we say, oh, he makes me do bad things. No, you do bad things all on your own, all right? Don't blame that on the devil. <laughs> that's, that's you. You want to do bad things, and you run and do them. Now, he can tempt you, but you want to do bad things on your own. The way the Bible typically teaches what Satan does is he stands before the throne of God, and he accuses us of our failures and accuses us to our hearts of our failures. The word Satan in the scriptures, it literally translates as prosecutor or accuser. And if you were to look at some Bible translations, they'll actually use that word, the accuser or the prosecutor. And so in Zechariah, what you have is God as the judge standing there. And Zechariah is essentially standing in the place of the people. So he's representing the people and he's being accused by this prosecutor. He's being accused of sin and complacency. And both those accusations are completely true. They're completely true of the people, and they're still true of us today. And so Joshua is shown to be standing in these filthy rags before the judge. That this is the idea when you see Joshua in these filthy clothes, that's supposed to represent us. We're supposed to see ourselves in, in that. That their sins were standing before them, and it made them unclean in the sight of God. This is pretty much all the point of the prophecies of Zechariah. And so what are the sins? Their sins are failure to rebuild the temple. And you might think, well, I'm easy on that one because I don't have to rebuild the temple. You know, Christ died for my sins. Great. Really, if you want to put it in our vernacular, this is failing to do what God directly called them to do. 
God calls us up to be first in our lives. Do we live with him as being first in our lives? The other sins then are idol worship and false worship. They worship themselves and they worship things. They worship their comfort. They worship their nationality. They worship all kinds of things other than Jesus first. So they appear in these soiled garments. And what it's pushing us to see is that righteousness is something that we do not have on our own. If we are only into what we are doing, we'll never be righteous before God himself. Now, biblically, the word righteousness has to do with relationship. It means you are right with somebody. We think you know, righteousness, and we think, oh, I always do the right thing. But righteousness in the Bible is always connected to this idea of relationship with God, that we are acceptable. And so the accusation is, you are not acceptable. These people are not acceptable. Look what they have done. You are not acceptable before God. Now, sometimes in our current cultural mindset and understanding, it's hard to understand these ideas of condemnation and accusation because we try to get everybody to have a positive mental image or a, or a good self-esteem. But I want to see if I can help you see how we all fall into the accuser's trap at times. Because it's not that he's wrong in his accusation. We just fail to focus upon what God has done about our own situation. When troubles come and bad things happen, maybe you lose a job, coronavirus takes over the world, uh, you get married and it doesn't go well, you know, all, all these different things, you get sick. A lot of times people will say, why God? But they say that out of complaint around people they know. And what studies have actually shown, the reality is when people can respond anonymously, many times when bad things happen in our lives, we think it's because of something we've done. We think there's some fault in ourselves and we're being punished and we deserve it. Now, they have looked at dreams to bear this out. And they look at dreams of people all over the world, and they may be different depending on the culture, but there's a common nightmare that people all over the world have, and it all deals with our perceived insecurities. You ever have a dream where you end up in a compromising position, where maybe uh, you are going to the bathroom and there's no walls, or you're undressed in public, or you make a mistake at a party and everybody laughs at you, or you did something dumb at work and you lose your job, or you're, all of your investments go away because you invested in the, in the wrong things, or you didn't really graduate from school, or you're trying to get away from the zombies and you can't get away because they're chasing you down, and oh, I can't get away with it. All that is is a deep psychological need that we want to be accepted, and we fear that we are not accepted. It shows a deep insecurity about whether we are acceptable. I hope you don't have nightmares tonight anyway. I'm just throwing it out there. But there's nothing worse than to think that you are underdressed or under something for something and everyone's looking at you disapprovingly, like everyone's judging you. It's the, oh, I've been found out imposter syndrome, that underneath we are not really as put together as we want everyone else to think that we are, that we're not as attractive or put together or as funny or smart as we want everyone else to think that we are. This week in the email update, when I talked about CTV being pushed off, I had like an hour before it went out and I hopped in and I typed and I wrote, hear this to talk about it. And I wrote H-E-R-E -E and not H-E-A-R. And I made a horrible typo and Sarah circles it and sends it to me and she goes, hey, did you mean to say this? My first response is, yeah. I'm like, hear this. But no, I made a horrible typo. My first response is to want to cover myself up, to not say, oh, yeah, I'm dumb. I can't figure out the English language. Is it, I, I don't know what to do here. The Bible calls that a deep need for righteousness. We don't feel like we're acceptable unless we have it all together. And this happens to people who say they believe in Jesus and people who don't believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus doesn't make this go away. I mean, sometimes if you want to tell someone about Jesus and you've been a Christian for a bit, you'll run into someone from your past and you'll tell them you're a Christian. They'll be like, what? What right do you to have represent this Jesus guy? You're like, exactly. When I first became a Christian, I was working at this gas station and this guy comes in uh, who I knew from high school and he was like, hey, where are the parties this week? Or where can I buy some substances I can't get at the normal store? And I'm like, I'm a Christian now. And he's like, ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, no, I'm serious. He's all right. He, he wouldn't believe me at, at all. Like, I know people from high school who still can't believe that I do what I do. I have an ex-girlfriend's dad who most likely thinks of me being a pastor is a big joke. And unless I'm a pastor for the devil, you know, but sometimes when you get confronted with your life in a previous form, there's an, there's an accusation and it wants to incapacitate you from living as God calls us to live in our lives. And we start to think, yeah, I have no right to say I'm a Christian or, or take his name upon my lips. I'm a poor excuse. How about this? 
Here's a good example because I see it a lot of time in churches because I'm part of a church. I know husbands who desperately want to start praying with their wives or their families. But because of what they have done, of how they've reacted, how they've done really things poorly, they feel like a hypocrite if they start, so they never even start. I know some people who, have, who are single and have friends and they want to be able to pray with their friends when their friends are in trouble, but they've never done it before and they feel so inadequate because of some of the things they do with their friends when they're out together. There's this voice inside that says, you're not good enough. They will never accept it if you want to change. You're not worthy enough to pray for them. You don't have the right. You have failed way too many times. That's the accusation. That's the prosecution. Maybe you pray and your prayer doesn't get answered and your first thought is, well, I don't deserve my prayers to ever get answered. When we see our weakness, when we fail, the accuser comes in and says, you call yourself a follower of Christ? Look what you've done. Look what your life was like just last night. Look at your life. Maybe you are married and your spouse has asked you, to, asked you to do something like a hundred times. You've never done it. Or they asked you not to do something a hundred times and you still do it. And they just kind of, well, I'm just going to give up. And they give up and then you give up and you think, yeah, exactly. I should just give up on everything. What's the point of ever changing? It just comes right back up over and over and over. You've already disappointed them. You've already disappointed God. You keep doing the same old things. Why try to be different at all? If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't continue to do that. And when the Bible speaks of that, that's the accusation of the prosecutor. That's what it's talking about. In your deepest, darkest place, when no one's looking and you're really honest, that's what it is. You got God as the judge. You got us in filthy garments. You got the prosecutor prosecuting day and night before the throne. And it's not just the Old Testament that talks about this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. See, the reason I think we're so deeply insecure many times is that metaphorically there is this courtroom and there's an accuser and a bar of justice and we're being accused there. It's like because of how our made, our conscience is naturally picking up this prosecution. And I know if you hang out with certain friends, they're like, oh, that's dumb, the devil. You've gone right up to the first grade. You don't have to believe in the devil anymore. But when we're honest, this rings true. It really does. Why is it, do you think, that old sins or failures, I don't want to call it a sin, your old failures, all these things flash back with such vividness sometimes? Now, we do all kinds of things to jam these radio sig signals in our head from the courtroom of our conscience. You can read books that tell you it's stupid. Uh, you can do drugs or drink or jump from relationship to relationship, get involved in self-help, but it's always still there. It always comes back again. Tim Keller wrote this. He said, our guilt not only has about it an indelibility, but even beyond that, it has a vividness and a freshness. Why? Because our guilt is not just a memory. Somebody alive is continually telling us about it. Somebody's actually bringing it up again and again. And this happens because our conscience is a good thing. God gave us our conscience because our conscience is supposed to remind us of the gospel. It's meant to lead us back to what God has done for us. But there are some things that have happened to our conscience because of our sin and we're listening to the wrong things. Uh, one writer says this, our conscience has not actually been killed by sin, it has been poisoned. And because it's been poisoned, we are constantly listening and focusing upon the wrong things. So what do we do about it? So glad you asked me, okay? Uh, the answer is found in the gospel. And Zechariah talks about this. So Zechariah chapter 3, starting in verse 1 again, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? That's like a stick that was on fire, pulled out of the fire. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Now what's really interesting in this is it tells you, here's Joshua, and then here's Satan, and the judge, and then the angel of the Lord, and then it says, the Lord said, and then it says, the angel of the Lord said. In, in the Old Testament, you have to understand, when it has this definite, the angel of the Lord, that's not an angel like Gabriel or Michael or something like that. The angel of the Lord is typically a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. 
And don't think of Jesus as an angel. The word angel only means messenger. It is the one who is bringing about the words of God to bring about his people's righteousness. And this person says, I will put clean clothes on you. And so when you have this courtroom that's there, it is not just the judge and us and the prosecutor. We also have an advocate that is there with us who removes our filthy rags, who removes our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And in these verses, the first thing that Jesus does here says, Satan, you cannot keep accusing and condemning this person because this person has been brought out of the fire. I have pulled the brand out. I've taken them out of sin. The condemnation is gone. Now, yes, you know, when you pull something out of the fire and it stops burning and it gets, you know, cold, it'll still get things dirty if you touch it with it because it's, you know, have you ever played with fire? I have. Anyway, but anyway, I get in trouble for it when I was growing up. But after you become a Christian, you have to understand that condemnation is gone, but many times some of that pollution still sits in our hearts. You still get angry at the wrong times. You still, uh, your mind thinks about things it shouldn't be thinking about. We still get off track, but Jesus is saying, yes, that's still there, but it can no longer bring you into condemnation. It is gone. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so what does Jesus say? Put clean robes on him. Take those filthy garments that they're standing in and get rid of them. Get rid of their own works that they've all been trying to do and put my works upon them. And this shows a doctrine in Christianity that we call justification. And it's a big word, and it means not only are our sins forgiven in Jesus, but his righteousness has been laid upon us. We have been clothed with it. Now, in our gospel class, I talk about this whole section on salvation, and I tell you that Jesus is our advocate before our bar of justice, but Jesus is more than just a defense attorney, because a defense attorney is trying to argue just to get you off the hook. Oh, these mitigating circumstances, they deserve a second chance, blah, blah, blah. Our advocate does no such thing. He doesn't do anything at all, because Jesus knows we're guilty, and he's not going to lie, so he doesn't argue for our innocence. What he argues is his substitution in our place. Jesus knows that we are guilty, so he comes and he dies for our sin on the cross, all that we deserve to die for, all that we are constantly accused of, all that our consciences seem to bring back up over and over and over. See, Zechariah is all prophecy and vision of what God is going to do when he steps into the world, into the realm of reality. Listen to this, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Does that sound familiar to you? Because those are the words that Jesus uses in the scriptures when he comes into Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry. Triumphal entry is what we celebrate on this thing called Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a week before what we celebrate as Easter. And Jesus essentially steps into Jerusalem, riding this colt, the foal of a donkey, to present himself as the coming Messiah who would take away the sins of God's people. And when Jesus comes, it's no longer prophecy, it becomes reality. Now, why this is so important is because this is a Jewish holiday known as Passover. Passover is one of the largest national holidays in Judaism. Uh, Israel swells like 10, 20 times the amount of people show up. And what they celebrate is how God in the Exodus comes and he passes over his people and brings them from death into life. The way they showed that they were in covenant relationship with God is they would take a blood of the lamb and they would put it on the door posts or door frames of their homes. That's how they showed it. So in Passover, over, there is a massive sacrificial system set up where these lambs die to show that the blood of the lamb is covering them and their sin. Typically, Passover sacrifices were chosen the Sunday before for the coming week sacrifice. Jesus shows up on a donkey on a Sunday before the coming week's sacrifice, showing himself to be the one who was set aside for the coming sacrifice for our sins. And Zechariah, this is what he is talking about. And so Jesus comes, and he lives, and he dies, and he rises from the grave to be our high priest and advocate forever. Right now, before the throne, Jesus says, because of what I have done, clean clothes go on my people. He doesn't beg the judge, the Father, for justice. What he says is justice for all the sins they've ever done. Justice, meet it out, and I will take it upon myself. 
and everything gets laid upon him. And that is how the accuser gets dealt with. Our foundation, our salvation is by sovereign grace, not our own efforts. The angel says this, chapter 3, verse 2, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, it's interesting because God looks at Israel as a people and he makes this amazing statement. He says, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I didn't choose you because you were, you were the largest country. I didn't choose you because you were the best. I didn't choose you because you knew how to drive in the middle of a roundabout. I didn't choose you because you were wonderful. He says, I chose you because I loved you. That's what he says. And we are now told that God rescues us because God has chosen to love us. Thomas Brooks was a Puritan preacher. He died in like 1680. And I want to read you something he wrote. I can take it in the vein that he wrote it. So often today, people want to be offended about everything. You can take this chauvinistically. It's not meant that way. But listen to this. He says, In law, we know that all the debts of the wife are charged upon the husband. Saith the wife to one another, If I owe you anything, go to my husband. So at this time, there's a debt the wife had. You would go to the husband for that debt. He says, So may a believer say to the law and to the justice of God, both good things, if I owe you anything, go to my Christ who hath undertaken for me. I must not sit down discouraged under the apprehension of those debts that Christ to the utmost farthing hath fully satisfied. Why does Christ fully satisfy it for us? Because he loves us. He chose to love us. And works will even say that we need to repent of being discouraged by our sins. We need to repent for thinking that our sins are too great for his mercy. And so we must not sit under that, oh, woe is me, everything's horrible. We sit in joy because of what God has done. And when the accuser comes at us, when we accuse ourselves, the only way beyond that to truly live in life-changing grace is remembering what Jesus did for us. That's how you deal with the accusation. I think if we understand the gospel and the reality of it as Jesus as our advocate, the righteousness he gives us, it will abolish our guilt because there's no way it couldn't because we are not guilty anymore. It has all been paid for. It enables us to live the life he actually calls us to without giving into the thoughts that say, oh, you're not good enough for this because we're not trying to be good enough because he has been good enough. And when the accuser comes up and we have those thoughts, look how terrible you are. Oh, you can't pray with your spouse. You can't pray with your friends. You can't do these things. What we get to say is, really, really? It's worse than you are even accusing me of. Have you even met me? I can much make a much better case against me than you ever could. But I'm acceptable in Jesus. He is my worthiness. He is my honor. He is my righteousness. That's what he is. And that abolishes guilt. And it will change your times of discouragement when we begin to understand the gospel. When you have a goal in your life and, and it doesn't happen or when we fail or you have all these crazy dreams of failing and the zombies catching you or, or whatever, it's fine because our ultimate aim is never those things that have failed. Our goal should always be Jesus. If we desire success in a relationship or something for our happiness, we're always going to feel discouraged because ultimately none of those things are Jesus. None of those things can actually fulfill us. If you have a goal in your life that has not been reached and you feel really depressed about it and it gets you down, that means what's happening is you relied on something for your righteousness other than Jesus. And when we get discouraged, there's only a few things that we can say. First off, we can say, well, I'll just get a new job, a new spouse, a new car, a new whatever. And you just start the start cycle all over again, and that's terrible. You can go the other direction and just get cynical and say, well, I'm just not going to care about anything anymore. I'm not going to put my hopes in anything. And that's terrible too. Or we can realize we became discouraged because something became more important to us than Jesus and we need to repent. We need to return just like God told his people to in Zechariah to understanding who he is. Over the last year and a half with COVID, I, I don't know if you've seen the news, but there's a ton of church leaders who have just just been taken out left and right for doing the dumbest things. And there's so many people when that happens, they go, well, I'm not going to follow, any, follow Jesus anymore. Look what that person did. And all that does is tell me is they were never following Jesus in the first place. They were following these people. People will always let you down. Don't worry, I don't have some bombshell I'm going to share with you right now. Okay, or something like that. But so often we are focusing on people and not the God who came to rescue and save us. Now think about this. Think if the church became full of a people who realized that our hope and life were truly found in Christ and Him alone. Think about this. If, if the church was full of people who learned how to deal with all the accusations of guilt 
and by abolishing our guilt in the grace of Jesus. Imagine if we live that way. We didn't get embarrassed when we wrote something dumb in the email update, where we didn't get embarrassed to try and like, make people not think that you know, we're as dumb as we actually are, where we're always trying to make people think we're better than them. Imagine if we just lived the reality of our lives, and we have a failure just like, boom, there's my failure. And you know what? It doesn't really affect me in the end, because Christ is my righteousness. My relationship with God comes from him. And I think when we begin to understand the gospel like that, we are going to be the church that Zechariah prophesied about. And that is what I want to be. This is one of the reasons that element, we have this vision of us being a community that is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we are a community that sees who God is and what he has done in our lives. And that then goes into and changes our relationships with one another. That we are those who can focus on that and not upon ourselves. Not how well we do whatever we do. Not how well other people do whatever they do but how God himself has come to give us his righteousness, that we are not a people who are trying to figure it all out ourselves. We are a people whose righteousness is found solely in him. I'm gonna invite the band to come back up. And as they do, I'm gonna invite you to take communion. And communion is a place to remember what Christ has done to rescue and save us. It's why you take a cracker and you break it because Christ's body was broken for us. You Take the grape juice and you drink that. And it's a reminder of his blood that was shed because we are a people who could not save ourselves. We had no righteousness of our own. We are in filthy rags. And yet the body and the blood of Christ takes our sins away and God recloses us in his righteousness. We get to be justified before who he is because of what he has done, not because of what we do. Our, this is why if there's any accusations that come against us, oh, you're not good enough, you're not this enough, you're not that enough, you're right, I'm not, but he is. And we always point there because that is where our identity and life come from. And if you need prayer today, maybe you're in a place where you feel like your life is just spiraling down and you don't know which way is up, we would love to be able to pray with you about understanding what the gospel truly brings, and how Jesus changes lives, especially yours and mine, ours. Uh, We are people who give because God gave so much to us, and so it's part of our worship every week. Uh, There are offering boxes next to all the doors. We don't pass a plate. It's always meant to be a response to what God is doing in our hearts and lives. Uh, Also, uh, when we're done, I'd invite you to, to grab one of the sermon notes or get the things online and maybe talk to some people that week about just those couple questions that are in there, you know, about the accusations of the devil and, and what that looks like and how you've thought about him and what he does versus what he actually does. And then coming to the place where we fully rest and trust in what Christ has done for us because that's how we live as the people of God, trusting him in all things because of what he has done. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, this morning I ask that you would take us and teach us what it means to be a people who find our righteousness in you. Our relationship with God is found through and in you. That we become acceptable, not because we are striving to always learn to do the right things, but that we have placed our faith in you and you alone. And the beauty of the gospel is how you've come to bring us back to yourself. And that we would begin to be a people who understand that much more deeply than we ever have. So our entire lives would be changed, that our focus would be upon you and our interactions with one another. And even the interactions within our own heart. that we would trust you enough to place all of our hopes and our fears in your more than capable hands. And that in the end, the goal of our lives would be you and your glory. Take us and move us to be a people who understand the gospel so deeply that we glorify you with every moment of our lives because you are the one who has given righteousness to us. Teach us to live in that righteousness. We ask this in your son's good name.
Amen.